Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be looking at Paul VI and how he predicted the future. That's right. We're going to be looking at the document Humanae Vitae by Pope St. Paul VI and all the prophetic statements it contained. Clearly, this great pope, a saint, predicted the future. And when you see these four prophecies and the way they've unfolded, your mind will be blown. Interesting topic here. An it's important topic. Too. Very important topic. Yeah. Uh, a lot of moral de decay in our society uh, was generated around his time, mm -hmm. and he did, never got to see the fruition of his proclamations in this encyclical. Yeah. Uh, but but boy, have they come true. Yeah. See, yeah. Seeing the overall disrespect for women, and like you said, the moral decline in society, and such sexual confusion and just the outbreak of all of these people polarized in all these different parties and how much political influence has really taken dominion. Uh, he clearly laid out some very striking and, and alarming uh, prof prophecies for sure. You know, and I think a lot of these are not prophecies per se. They're not visions. But what they really are, I think, is almost the consequences of natural law being broken. And he had the foresight to be able to say, if natural law by the means of artificial contraception is broken. These are the consequences. So mm -hmm. it might be more fair to say he predicted mm -hmm. the consequences of the widespread adoption of artificial contraception mm -hmm. and how it would impact women, men, marriage, society, and even the government. Mm -hmm. And attentive to the logical outcomes of decisions being made at the level of the government at that time and seeing that firsthand, taking that to prayer, Prophetic utterances really, you know, are, are ones that come in the sense of what is to come. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a way, uh, Paul VI in his prophetic nature as pope, as well as priest and baptized member of the mystical body of Christ, each of us should be attentive to the realities of our life and looking ahead logically at some of these outcomes. So that's the role of every baptized Christian. Yeah. So Humanae Vitae was the last of Pope Paul VI seven encyclicals. And Humanae Vitae, typically an encyclical is named after the first words or the first statement of it. Mm -hmm. So Humanae Vitae is Latin for of human life. Uh, this was written by Paul VI. It was dated July 25th, 1968. So this is really kind of in the cusp of the sexual revolution happening in the 60s. Um, and this really takes into account the debate that was going on around the time about whether or not the Catholic Church should permit artificial contraception, means to prevent um, the sexual act <clears throat> from, you know, the conceiving a baby. Yeah, yeah, it's interference. Yeah. And, and it's, it is uh, a form of cutting off the intimacy that— And the reverence. And the reverence that ought to be given— to man and woman as God has created and ordered them. Mm -hmm. This this is throwing major interference into natural law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there, was, there was serious debate and serious, actually, disagreement with Paul VI. Uh, there was a commission that he that was instituted before him to write, writing this to help advise him on it, and they actually, uh, you know, it was very split on to whether or not it should be accepted, you know, whether or not that those, um, those means of uh, contraception could be permissible. And he actually went against the advice of one of those councils that they said it could be permissible. But I think in his wisdom, and that's what we're going to get into is these prophetic and these forward looking, um, you know, I guess, rational consequences, why he was so right in issuing this and why Catholics really should adopt this. Because if you, if you look at the studies, I think it's like, 70% of Catholics disregard the church's teaching on contraception mm -hmm. and it's to their own detriment. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we wanted to do this because it is a very tricky subject. It's a very personal subject, but there is some real wisdom both from human law and from inspired from the, from the teaching position in the chair of the church. Mm -hmm. So why don't we get into uh, this first one here, Father Rich? So the first one is infidelity and moral decline. The Pope first noted that the widespread use of contraception would, quote, lead to conjugal infidelity, 
and the general lowering of morality. And we could see on a surface level from the 60s and the sexual revolution to present day, this growing moral depravity and the acceptance of things back in the 60s that couldn't even been imagined. And as a result of that, we could see a slippery slope. So in the sense of where Paul VI is coming from, he's coming from objective truth, and he's coming, in a sense, from logical outcomes to decisions being made mm-hmm. in granting permissions to use these realities of contraceptives. And how this necessarily, once you introduce it, is going to create a whole sense of temptation for the human person within conjugal relationships. And what that means is conjugals meaning, you know, marriage. That Mm -hmm. now if I have been given this tool where I'm not going to get someone pregnant and now I could use this tool in my extramarital relationships, it creates a sense of false safety. Yeah. And now I'm going to explore that false safety because I have really nothing to lose. Yeah. I mean, it would be like, you know, people jumping out of a plane without a parachute. You mm-hmm. knew the consequences. Yeah. And now when you have artificial contraception, you have a parachute and you now feel free to do a more dangerous, um, you know, action. <clears throat> and I don't think that, I mean, I don't think anyone can deny that since the 60s, the amount of marriages, the the divorce rate, the amount of marriages that um, report infidelities has the skyrocketed. Birth, the birth rate, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the birth rate in Japan right now is 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 collapsing. Well, the birth rate in the United States is below replacement. It's right. been re- below replacement since the seventies. Mm-hmm. You know, and here's one of the things is that another thing that I think that's part of this, and we'll get into it later, but is. Having a child now is looking, is starting to be conceived by a lot of people as a punishment for having sex, not the natural and right outcome of it. Uh-huh. It's like, oh, we had this thing in the contraception, then we're going to have a baby. It's an accident. It's a baby's and an this accident. is the punishment. Yeah. You know, it, like, like that's the negative outcome of sex when that is the God more, given. That is the reason uh, to have sex. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the thing, uh, you know, you can even expand it too. And I know we're going to get into some other things, but, you know, wh- why, why divorce? Well, you know, if, if you're a man, you know, you're, you're woven into your character, woven into who, how God created you is to father children and protect them. Right. So that's your identity, not not to 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 have gratuitous sex with whoever you want with no consequences. And mm-hmm. so what happens is inside of your brain, you're thinking, wow, there's this contraception. I can go out and lend anything to my lust for mm-hmm. other women. And so now you have so many divorces because men just are, are not attached to the value that they have and how they were created to protect. And, men and, and these women. are the these are the, the outcomes, babies. divorces, abortion, out of wedlock pregnancies, venereal diseases, all other sorts of sexual, uh, you know, complications. And clearly, exactly what you're saying, that's that's the outcome. Yeah. And, and that's what these false safeties provide. And when you divorce the fact that the sexual act, the conjugal act ought to always be open to life. When you remove life, you're also removing the human dignity of the person that you are exchanging in this action of love. You're divorcing love from the action, Mm -hmm. you're divorcing the person, and you're treating the person (coughs) as a masturbatory tool. That's right. You know, here, so this in particular comes from Humana Vitae 17, which was the consequences of artificial methods. And this is what he said specifically. Let them first consider how easily this course of action could open wide the way for marital infidelity and a general lowering of moral standards. Not much experience is needed to be fully aware of human weakness and to understand that human beings, and especially the young, who are so exposed to temptation, need incentives to keep the moral law. And it is an evil thing to make it easy for them to break that law. And and that's back to natural law. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we are absolutely interfering with what God has set into place. And and natural law gives us guiding principles and guiding tools that we would follow the right path. Mm-hmm. This adds additional paths that don't move in a direction that is good for the human person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and lowering your moral standards and, and, you know, even with divorce is like, you know, I'm just sick of this woman. I can always go find somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is they all become these replaceable. Families, 
Right. The, the families, yeah, they're exchangeable, but the families are bra- are broken, and kids naturally look at themselves as being their the, the, their fault. Mm-hmm. And so the kids end up, you know, turning to other things because they don't feel loved by a mother and a father. Mm-hmm. And so we see that in our society, too, still today. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Now, kind of speaking also to what you were saying and what you were saying about turning a person into a, a basically a masturbatory object. Uh, this one, I think, is really important, especially for women to consider because, you know, the pill was marketed as freedom and liberation for women. Finally, you're free. You're free from that whole having to have a baby thing if you want to go out and have sex. And if you want to express your sexuality and you want to be a independently sexual woman, just like a man can be, you're free now. What a lie. What a terrible lie foisted on womanhood and how they were manipulated into believing that to be true. So in Humanae Vitae 17, this, this one is, I think, really important to read. He also says, another effect that gives cause for alarm is that a man who grows accustomed to the use of contraceptive methods may forget the reverence due to a woman and, disregarding her physical and emotional equilibrium, reduce her to being a mere instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires, mm-hmm. to no longer considering her as his partner with whom he should surround with care and affection. Mm-hmm. You know, when you give... <laughs> Unfortunately, if you give men the ability to use you without consequence to them, you're not getting free. They're getting free. Mm-hmm. Dudes are getting free yeah. to use you. Mm-hmm. Well, they're the, you're you're allowing them to become enslaved. But but it's also it's an appeal to women that this is freedom, and it's an appeal to base uh, passions mm-hmm. in both respects, men and women. But it's it's accommodating for men's passions and women following their desire to be loved, now they have a way to test that out. Mm -hmm. Well, the testing of love is not based on physiological exchange. Gratification. It's based on intellectual, spiritual, and affective exchange, Mm -hmm. the exchange of heart. And when one discerns relationship based on these modes of interaction, we begin to see that there is something manifesting beyond physical attraction or sexual attraction, there's something more here. There is a greater love. And when you exchange physical love as the first and foremost exchange, there's confusion there because the body is communicating to the mind, the heart, and the soul that I'm loved and I'm cared for. But that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth because manipulated by intention and 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 um, temptation Something much worse will be communicated yeah. to the heart. You know, something that I notice in, in culture right now is that we are in such a consumeristic culture. And because we're everything's so geared towards consumerism, things now become these object of lust. Like, man, I have to have this the best new Apple computer, the best Nikes, I want the newest phone, I want the most awesome Tesla. And the things that are used are now the golden calves of our modern society. Those are the things that are worshipped. And those are the things that everyone looks at that have value because we're consumeristically oriented. So when a young girl grows up in this society and they see these are the things that are valued, things that are used, they then are given this twisted perception that if they are used, they are valued. So then that's why you're going to see these and they, girls. And they also tie that to power, that, yeah. that you have power with your feminine sexuality. Mm-hmm. You have influence. So power, influence, all of these different... Value. And, and that, that you are valued and you're loved in that. Yeah. The, these scopes, absolutely. You know, any human being, but specifically for a woman's ethos and, and, her, and her, you know, her physiological and mental makeup, too is going to be driven in these in these poles. Yeah, yeah. You know, so let's just pretend for a second that God knew what he was doing when he made a man and a woman. Let's just pretend yeah. okay. that that God knew exactly what he was doing. Man should not be alone, right? The the intimacy between a man and a woman is a foreshadowing or a uh, a, a look beyond to the intimacy of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is a mini Trinity. It is a mini exchange between the Father and the Son. It is a mini exchange of, it's a foreshadowing of heaven to the communion that you have. Mm-hmm. It is the most intimate act between a man and a woman. 
it is also life giving to that man Amen. and that woman. Amen. It it heals mm -hmm. the man and the woman in when they're in exchange of of being angry. It uh, is also a way of rejoicing with a couple. All these things woven in the outcome of that that God grants through that is the birth is is procreation. Well, when are so, human beings more like God than when they are creating life? Mm -hmm. Right. So like the yeah, you're literally creating with the synapsis of of love with the father and the son and 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 you know, I'm I'm giving this trinitarian thing and it's probably not coming out no, right. No, this is it's like that Rublev thing that you bring up a lot. No, it's coming out perfectly yeah, no, because yeah, it is which very... is which is over my bed. Yeah, exactly. Right? It, it, it literally is is over my bed because God is inviting us to share in his life, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. and in in marriage that is that is the archetype. That is what God had planned. Mm -hmm. And so in, in doing this, and my wife teaches natural family planning. I mean, since the 70s, we've gone so far down on this, uh, this uh, contraception stuff. She actually teaches natural family planning, and that's come a long way, too, mm -hmm. as well. There's devices you can use to tell whether or not you're mm -hmm. pregnant. Um, and so now you look at all these children, and then as a father, this is the outcome of that mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. And it is also, in, in retrospect, I mean, looking back on it and looking at my family now, is, it is the, it's like the Holy Spirit. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. you have this exchange of love, this, this uniting of two hearts that God created you for, again, through prayer and discernment. Mm -hmm. And then now you have this gift of all these mm -hmm. children. And literally, you can just sit there and just experience this 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 Trinitarian, you know, mm -hmm. idea. Mystery, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a so mystery. It is. It's absolute mystery. Yeah, but to also plug for my wife, if any of you guys want to <laughs> do natural family planning, she's licensed, and you can DM us or whatever. And, yeah, and what good. I love to hear, and, and it's, it's something that I, I really love to hear from both of you guys, as well as Howard, is just your overall respect for your wife mm -hmm. and you grow in such a reverence and a respect for your wife in, in that, you know, in that she is the one who bears life. She is the mystery mm -hmm. and ordered to that mystery and, and being protective over that mystery and honoring mm -hmm. that mystery. You know, you are generative, you are fruitful, you are mm -hmm. multiplying. And that is precisely where God wants to fulfill fill us yeah. is is in seeing that. Like you're saying, you're looking at this mystery. You have Rublev's Trinity above your bed. You're seeing this mystery unfold in your life through suffering and joy. Mm -hmm. And and we could see clearly then, you know, St. Paul the Sixth is expressing from, from get-go the breakdown of infidelity and moral decline. Very clear prediction. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing a, a second prediction from this conversation that there is an overall loss of respect for woman mm -hmm. as she is yeah. created by God. Yeah, and then men lose their role as a protector. Mm -hmm. They no longer give her that, that, that care and surround her with the dignity that she's due as who you are leaving your parents for to become one flesh with. You know, if you look at the you know, the nature of the Trinity and you look at the nature of Christ and the hypostatic union, you know, and you look at the, you know, Trinitarian theology, there's so many, Ryan, like you're saying, parallels in marriage. And I, you know, I think Ryan, you're right. Maybe we just presume maybe God had it right here. Well, and then the other thing too, is if you're going to present all these faults and all this decline, you should also present like what God intended. intended. And, and this is a, this is a, a new phenomenon, right? I mean, abortion's always been around, like people have always wanted to kill their, their children, um, for, you know, whatever e reason. And, and now you're looking at it going, okay, so the divorce rate was never at 50%. It wasn't ever even close. Now men were in, there's infidelity. There's all these things. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's and no, there was, there was childbearing out of wedlock, uh, right? There was men who were governed by their passions yeah. and pursuing women and women, you know, not being virtuous or chaste. And there were uh, abortions done outside. But of, on know, this scale, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Once the gates open, bro, close. like once the gates open, yeah. I mean, why does that gate? I mean, yeah. it, it went from a, a localized sickness, a localized sickness to a worldwide raging pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that is really the difference. And in, in, it weaponized mm -hmm. these things that had always been there, but were and, well, societally and, frowned upon and also hard to achieve. And, mm -hmm. and the and the reason why I bring up like what God is and intended is that that takes work, that takes suffering, uh, just like anything else in the Christian life. Like you don't experience that without suffering. You can't experience a deeper intimacy with your spouse without suffering through 
getting through things together and, mm -hmm. and growing together and, and sacrificing for one another. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't do that. And I just think now it's just, people are just like, they don't want to go through that. It's just you, like, you, why do I have, why do I need all this garbage mm -hmm. when I can just have the, the cherry on top? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what, what do I need this stuff for? You know, I, one of the greatest pieces of wisdom that was ever given to me going through the seminary um, and I give a shout out to one of my brothers, uh, Tim Holita, who's, who's a great priest out in uh, PT, a, a mutual friend of ours. Um, but, you know, we were talking about celibacy and, you know, you know, priests are men, you know, and, and we're, we're driven by the same natural desires that any man is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, how am I going to be celibate for the rest of my life? How can I exercise the virtue of chastity for the rest of my life when I have these drives? And, you know, and, and that's, this is, you know, if I have a false safety everywhere I turn, yeah. that could be as promiscuous as I, as yeah. I want to be. Yeah. Is that going to make me, you know, have the sense of freedom and I'm happy and I'm joyful? No, it's going to do something much worse. But what Tim, what Tim offered, he was like, you know, every time that I'm uh, like, I experience this, I just run the logical outcome. It's like, okay, am I willing to marry this woman? have children, take care of the kids, be, you know, and, and run this whole logical system out yeah. of what all of this actually and means tails. as opposed to like, wow, you're hot and let, let's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and, and it, it seems simple. It seems super simple, but it absolutely worked, right? Yeah. We don't have that in society because cult culturally we're presented a totally different narrative. Mm -hmm. And, and thank God in our Catholic Church, we promote the virtues. Mm -hmm. We promote disciplines. We promote things like exodus, you know, for men to be ascetical and to be disciplined in mm -hmm. their body and to take cold showers and have mortifications in their life, have fraternity where other men are calling you to be a man. Something greater. Something yeah. greater is before and you pursue it. Yeah. Like, why are we going to cheapen our life and our dignity and not pursue something great? Mm -hmm. We have the capacity for greatness. Well, the only way we're going to get there mm -hmm. is if we motivate one another and fulfill what Christ is calling out to us to That's do. That's right. Yeah, there's something different about the life of a Christian, and uh, there always is, because the world is going to offer you everything on a platter, and then you've got the, the Christian life, which is suffering, yeah. and, the, and the grace that comes through and in that, and the growth that you have in the kingdom of God as a child of God those things are completely just thrown out, yeah. you know, like it's just, it's just dumb and tiresome. You know, Paul, the six kind of, he, he anticipated that there was going to be a lot of pushback on this. I mean, he knew it. He was, he was a smart man. You know, he knew that this was not going to be an easy pill to swallow pun intended. Right. Mm -hmm. So in 18, he said the concern of the church, it is to be anticipated that perhaps not everyone will easily accept this particular teaching. There is too much clamorous outcry against the voice of the church, and this is intensified by modern means of communication. Mm. But it comes as no surprise to the church that she, no less than her divine founder, is destined to be a sign of contradiction. Amen. We are a sign of contradiction, and we should be, and that's what Christ calls us to be, that we should be a contradiction to the moral standards of the day. We should be a contradiction to the treatment of women. We should be a contradiction to men thinking that that's going to give them happiness. But, but still, again, I'm going back to this contradiction, which is great. But we, and we talked about, you know, martyrs, you know, going into being martyred and maybe not being a true martyr. Like, what, you have to be careful to, to, to pursue this contradiction without the grace that flows from the, the way that God is imagined, like the way that God has created your life, mm -hmm. right? The way that God has put forth this. So yeah, this is not a contradiction just to be like, ha we're different. No, than no, no, you. no yeah. I know, but there's a difference. I think there's some people that look at that and they go, you know, I have to be contradictive to everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, but it's, it's more of a hidden life of, of how God has created you and, and what he um, wants from you. And the grace that comes from that, the, the the lasting happiness and the joy that comes from that, and 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 uh, Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II's uh, um, theology of the body. I mean, like, what an eye opening thing. I mean, he carried his predecessor's document into a very substantial 
catechetical you know, teaching. Yeah. Catechetical teaching on marriage, mm-hmm. on the human body, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah, these I think are Ryan, this that, is what like what you're saying. Like, that is okay. Well, sure, we know we're not what to do, but what is the positive way? Why, why are we not doing it? Why are we not doing it? Makes the, so much sense. You know, what should we do yeah. if we're not doing this? And theology of the body, I think, is kind of the answer to what you were saying there. Like, yeah. how, why is marriage important? Why yeah. is there this union? How is this uh, yeah. a, a reflection of the the, the Trinity? You know? Yeah, and this was the warning. Right. Yeah. I mean, in my, in this my opinion, was warning. this was a, this was a warning that was sent that was unpopular. Mm-hmm. Thanks be to God. He did it. Yep. Um, but this shows timeless, mm-hmm. timelessness of the teachings of Christ. And, and one of the most popular popes and the pilgrim pope in St. John Paul II providing the remedy in the theology of the body to treat the systemic disease right. of what this is affecting in society, and now having the modern means of communication, look at what we're talking about mm-hmm. in relationship to Paul the Sixth. He's seeing governments, you know, yeah, and this... powers mm-hmm. that are embracing this population control uh, ideology, and they're putting this into practice. And then you know, look at look at what he experienced in relationship to the human person, in light of World War II, mm-hmm. and what just, happened to you yeah, know. That's just another. <laughs> yeah. So I, you he, know, I always hear the statement, "You are the carbon they want to reduce." Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. And, and and I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah. You know, they want less people because mm-hmm. it makes it easier to manage. It makes resources go a little bit further. I was listening you know? to Elon Musk talk on this podcast and he was like, the birth rate's low. Like we have to worry about this. Yeah, right? Like course. we have to worry about this because, you know, finding effective people to do jobs, to advance sort of his technological I- ideas, which we all love, you know, going to Mars. I mean, what kid didn't want to do that? But, you know, when, when he said that, he said something very interesting. He's like, why do people not have children? He goes, well, they tell you that it costs too much. And he goes, that is the most absurd statement I've ever heard in my life. He started going through numbers, and he's like, even a poor person today can afford five or six kids. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. In the United States, obviously, he was talking about that. Uh, another one of them is, you know, I, I don't know like I don't know if I'll be able to work. I don't know if I'll be able And he's like, that's nonsense, too, because all these people have money for health. You know, he's just like looking at health care and child care. And I'm just sitting there listening to him going, this, this guy's like a super rational person, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He's saying some of the same stuff, yeah. you know, like the, all the lies. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking to what you said, Father Rich, you know, in, in Humana Vitae, speaking about the government, um, here's what he said. Do you want to read that or do you sure. want me to take it? Careful consideration should be given to the danger of this power passing into the hands of those public authorities who care little for the precepts of the moral law, who will blame a government which is in its attempt to resolve the problems affecting an entire country, resorts to the same measures as are regarded as lawful by married people in the solution of a particular family difficulty. Who will prevent public authorities from favoring those contraceptive methods which they consider more effective? Should they regard this as necessary? They may even impose their use on everyone. It could well happen. Therefore, that when people, either individually or in family or social life, experience the inherent difficulties of the divine law and are determined to avoid them, they may give into the hands of public authorities the power to intervene in the most personal and intimate responsibility of husband and wife. That could not be more clear and and prophetic. Prophetic. You know, and, and it's Pandora's box. Yeah. And how does how does the government do this? Look at the media. Look at what's being presented and marketed. Look at the elites. Look at all the people that are controlling mm-hmm. these politicians. Well, look at communist regimes that dictate mm-hmm. that you can only have one child. Look at human and humanitarian aid to Africa Bill contingent Gates foundation contingent on them taking contraception mm-hmm. and their governments accepting contraception. You can wipe out a whole I mean, you, well, could, you could, I mean, like eugenics, like the eugenics idea of, of, of when yeah. you know, the lady that founded Planned Parenthood. Margaret Singer. So, like, like look at this. <clears throat> the government is using the same thing. So that married couples in the solution of a particular family difficult. Well, we don't got enough money for another kid. So let's just contracept. Well, we don't have, a, we don't have the money for another million children. Let's just push contraception. Yeah. It's the same natural extension. Global scale. On a larger scale, it's a, it's to the same magnitude, mm-hmm. and then when governments can 
have the ability to even allow this. They or, influence it on a greater scale. They sure do. It's and now that's not a, a personal thing. choice. Now it's the government making the choice for you. I mean, it, and marketing companies, marketing a, a life and a culture around it. This is and, not fear mongering. This is a very, very real thing that has happened and will happen. And you should fight like everything to prevent it from happening in your own country. And here he's just saying you should give this careful consideration. Yeah. He's not saying this has happened. But he's it, just predicted it. But it did. Yeah. But it did. It's fascinating. You know, I mean, that's I mean, these are prophetic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, what is to stop it? Who can even blame a government when they don't care about moral and natural law? They're like, look, I don't know, man. It's not going to be a great harvest this year. Corn futures are down. Let's just tell everybody no births this year. Wow, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Let's just make some public policy so kids have so couples have less children. I got a visit from the pharmaceutical company. They're putting a lot of money in my pocket. Yeah, let's uh, oh, right or let's just say uh, you know we're in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe we should just increase funding to Planned Parenthood so that there's more abortions so that we don't have to deal with all these poor kids in the ghetto. I don't want to deal with that. Kill them. I don't want to deal with it. Kill them. That's and, that's the mentality. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and this is and, a, and, and poor black children are disproportionately affected by abortion. And I, I had to say that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I mean, it, the 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 founder of Planned Parenthood, the the purpose of it was to make them extinct. It's to be in the poor areas to get rid of them. She so called them have human weeds. Of, yeah, she called them human weeds. And and they're and basically, it's like creating a utopia, like living without them. We don't have to care for them. I mean, it's a macrocosm of like. The uh, of getting rid of a baby because you don't want to take yeah, care of it. Yeah, it's a problem. So let's just let's not have a problem. Let's not suffer with these let's people. Not have, let's just drink and let's watch TikTok and not deal with it. Let's just kill them and this not even a have secret. a problem. This yeah. is a secret, a dirty little secret. Yeah. The other thing, too, um, which has come out, obviously, I think in the 80s or 90s, they actually did scientific studies on women, women's health for people that have had um, uh, that have been taking contraception. And you know, you'll hear from a woman, like, it regulates my period. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. You know, what do you do when you're, you know, getting into... But the reality is it, 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 there's carcinogens in this, and then it's caused problems with women having children. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is this this uh, drug, what it does is it tells your body that it's pregnant, mm -hmm. right? So you're releasing basically a chemical into your body that's telling your body that it's pregnant. And in doing so... You're... So the, the question then is, is the body pregnant? No, no, it's not. Can it can it can it be assumed that then this chemical interference would be presenting a lie to the body and to the mind yeah. to the body? Again, yeah. it goes back to God created us fine the way we are, mm -hmm. you know, and He has a plan for marriage that's beautiful, and it doesn't involve the bedroom yeah. interfering in the bedroom with with medicine. Yeah, but just take a look at also men. I don't want to keep on singling out women. I mean, men using condoms or relying on women to take the pill, pressuring yeah. the women to take a pill. They've become so, you know, the the amount of, uh, of pornography, the amount of uh, sexual health issues related to men for the proliferation of masturbation. I mean, these are real things. These are real outcomes that are all from that sexual revolution and the change of mind from sex being the unitive act of marriage to a contraceptive act for pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, and men and women are affected. And, but I would still say women are affected disproportionately by mm -hmm. this, but men are affected by it as well. You know, yeah. well, the, look at how it makes, basically breaks down a man and makes him completely slothful and everything that a man is made fun of on a cultural level in society, it, it comes to fruition because man doesn't have to discipline his, his flesh. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to grow strong in virtue. And if, if esto vir means be a man in Latin and vir is the very root of what man is, and that is the root of virtue, mm -hmm. you know, we have, we have no virtue in society that's calling men to this level of capacity of greatness. Mm -hmm. And, and if that's the case, you know, it, this majorly affects man yeah. in, in a huge way. You know, when you, when you think of the devil as the, the author of sin and, and the prince of lies, you know, and, you know, and how cunning, as the scripture says, the devil is, yeah. you know, and how cunning government is and how cunning in, in the subcultures of society People concede their opportunity to be great, and they fall to base passions. It's it, you know society has fallen to the woes of these 
prophetic utterances and predictions of Paul the Sixth, and we're seeing it, and we need to look at this very clearly. Mm-hmm. And I hope that this podcast is really helping people see this a little more clearly in the eyes of Paul the Sixth and what we're seeing now. Now, I would say the fourth one and the final one that we'll say, and I, and I encourage everyone to go and read this document. If you've read it, go reread it. If you've never read it, we'll put a link. Make sure you read it. And this is one I think that's just now kind of coming to mm-hmm. the the bad fruition. We're just seeing this aspect of it because this is maybe a little bit more of a, a longer growing season on this negative side effect. And he predicted that once you start to have contraceptive methodologies available, what it does is it's a rejection of the natural order of how God created us, which then rejects God's dominion in creating us, which then assigns the dominion in the mind of mankind to themselves. Yep. They now have unlimited dominion over their body, which opens up the permissive nature towards things like transgenderism, to self-mutilation, to human cloning, to um, designer babies, to plastic surgery, to a very distorted image of the, themselves and a sadness over who they are and the a desire to change it because they don't accept themselves. And look, at, and look at you even take it a little bit further with social media and you look at all these people posting fake pictures of their bodies yeah. and what they're doing and they're, you know, a lot of young kids are looking at this stuff thinking that their life sucks. I mean, it even carries on into the, the current media. It sure situation. does. And, and how even in the youth, with among the youth, um, children, you know, wanting to be accepted as a dog or a cat or some other type of animal Mm -hmm. and that they eat on the floor out of a bowl and you have to respect that during lunchtime I'm going to be here with my other cat associate friends or my other dog. Have you heard about this stuff? I mean, it's it's happening. I mean, the, the, the... it's it's limitless, right? Mm-hmm. Where this could it go exa- because it's unlimited dominion. dominion. It's limitless. Yeah, you have unli- there. You go unlimited yeah. dominion. It's, a, it's like it was prophetic. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Isn't this cool though? It's crazy. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's like, just crazy that he wrote this in, in 1968. His 60s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Golly. and this, seriously, no one back then considered that there was no human mind that was grasping this right. in this way. I, I mean, mm-hmm. maybe very, very few. But this, is the, but this is why natural law is so important mm-hmm. because natural law has, you know, a, a, an inverse reaction when it's violated. That's There's right. an inverse reaction. It yeah. is just like the laws of nature, the laws of the natural human, you know, natural law has a reaction yeah, when it's violated. human has natural law just like, you know, the, the ocean has a natural law, oh, yeah. you know, just like the forest has a natural law and, and, you know, protecting these things and all that, you know, when, when those, those natural laws are, you know, uh, in the cross section of, of human development or whatever, interference, let's call it, then then you don't see that nature anymore. You mm-hmm. start to see, you know, plastic bottles in the ocean and massive clumps. You start to see, you know, things pile up and trash and all these other things, you know? Mm-hmm. You start to see, you know, things that are, that if you go against, you are basically a social pariah, that if you have an issue with uh, men dressed as women reading to your children at the library, yeah. if you have a problem with that, you are a social pariah. That's messed up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have an issue with um, people mutilating themselves and saying that it is a healthy thing to do to mutilate yourself, to appease a obvious mental um, issue, you know, a psychological issue. And if you think that that's wrong and that these people need more care than just um, permissiveness, then you are a social pariah. So, So this unlimited dominion, this is a very important point here, which is you know, kind of taking this a little bit further, but the unlimited dominion is a personal decision in in this particular case. But now what it's become is it's become a decision that's being absolutely forced onto children, Mm -hmm. forced on. So now, you know, even, even this unlimited dominion that we have with our own bodies and where we can go with all this stuff, now these people are so freaking miserable they're literally abusing children into well, it. Well, Delacrosse, we do have dominion over our children as fathers, right? Yeah. We have dominion over our children by the natural law. And again, this is a perversion of that dominion over their children mm-hmm. where they're like... Or, mm. or teachers or, I mean, you're starting to see all this stuff where, 
these people are absolutely miserable to abuse a four or five year old child. Yeah. To try to get them to be like them. Right. To get or attention to for themselves. It's Munchausen tell, by proxy through right. sexual dysphoria. Yeah. It, it, it is a, I mean, it, it's, it, there's definitely mental health now involved in this dominion. Mm -hmm. You know, the concern that I'm, you know, as I'm listening to you guys and, and the growing concern that I have in society is that people try to take and get a hold of authority from God and, and uphold the dominion that the Lord has established on earth. Mm -hmm. And God has established in his created order dominion within natural law. And the evil actions that are happening in the world are other people are trying to take this authority away. Look at the counselors of Paul the VI. You know, thank God for Paul the VI being so bold and courageous to be able to put this out there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he had sleepless nights thinking about it. How, how should I be pastoral? Should I should I take the counsel of this person who's saying no, they should you know contraceptives should be used in this case or in that case? If Paul the Sixth didn't stand up and write this document for the world, the church would not have this touchstone, Grounding. this foundation that was expressed before the movement even started to take flesh. And thank God, because within the church, we have something so golden yeah. and, and established so well. And could He's you not doing it in retrospect. Could you imagine if Paul the Sixth was governed by his, by his fears? Yeah. You know, and oh, I, I don't know if I Pressure. should. If I should, I mean, people would like me a lot more if I just said, "Hey, go and who all well, the things you want." And, and, and when you have a cases, vacuum of leadership and you right. don't have people stepping up in yeah. society and doing something about it, yeah, you know, like that's why. I, well, that's one of the biggest mistakes in parenthood is being permissive because then you're friends with your your kid and they're like, "Yeah, I'm permissive. I'm cool, man. I'm the cool dad and I'm the cool mom." Permissiveness is not loving. Mm -hmm. You know, permissiveness is. It's negligence, mm -hmm. you know, too often. And what you said really reminded me <clears throat> of the first the first sin, you know, in the Garden of Eden, where the, the serpent is tempting them. Take a bite of this and your eyes will, will be open and you will be like God. You will be like God. And that is the first temptation and the first thing that humanity fell for. That is the nature of our fall is that we want to become Domino. God. We want to become Lord. We yeah. want to become God. And we're not. Mm -hmm. And and how many times does God say, be not afraid, right? Because the the serpent in, in this particular case is, is a, in Hebrew, it's mm -hmm. more of a monster. Mm -hmm. And the fear was put inside mm -hmm. of them. And so the, the, this world, when, when you move towards comfort, Right when you move towards that, you're you're literally afraid. Mm -hmm. Right, you're afraid of what what it would be like to do something different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. right? Benedict what the are 16th, people going to say? Benedict the Sixteenth said, "You are not made for comfort. You are made for greatness. Mm -hmm. That is what you are made for. You are not made for that." And greatness requires sacrifice and leadership. That people choose their conscience and what is objectively right over the social implications. So we have to pray for bishops. We have to pray for our pope. We have to pray for leaders. We have to pray for parents to truly step up in the leadership of the domestic church mm -hmm. in their homes Engage with their children. With their dominion. Engage your dominion and your authority that's given to you when you baptize your children. Mm -hmm. And you, don't step outside of your authority, though. Yeah. Don't step outside. Stay in your lane. I love Bill Belichick. He just tells everyone, do your job. Yeah. You do your job. Don't worry about anyone else. Things will work out. Do your job. Be a be a father. Be mm -hmm. a father. Be a priest. Mm -hmm. Do your job and don't try to overextend your dominion. Don't take the bite of the apple and try to become yeah. like God. Yeah. It's be true. a servant. It's and, true. And we're all sinful. And and God provides mercy and sacraments for us to to give us this divine attachment to mm -hmm. his will, this divine love inside of us that we can accomplish this. We can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. We need Christ's help. Yeah. And, you know, we hope that this was helpful to you, that this episode and cracking open Humana Vitae, and I want to echo what Ryan Shield said to you just a few moments ago. Go into the show notes, click the link to Humana Vitae. It's on the Vatican website. And really, if you just type in on human life, Pope Paul VI in your Google, it'll, it'll pop You'll up. Find it. Yeah. Read that document. Get to know what he's expressing on a prediction level, on a prophetic level. And you, my brothers and sisters, you have been baptized in Christ, priest, 
prophet and king. And it's time for us to be prophetic and look at the trajectory of society and the trajectory of our own life and begin to take up dominion within our lane so that we may participate in the transformation of our world that's entrusted to our care and our stewardship. We wish you the very best. Continue to pray for us as we pray for you. And a big, big thank you to each of our patrons out there that support the show, to all of our subscribers, to all who follow us on social media. Make sure you're giving us thumbs up and spread the good news. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.